Good morning, church. How are we this morning? Just as we try to get ourselves going over here. Uh, welcome to church today. Um, my name is Corinne. I'm one of the pastors here at Westwood. Um, this is our second to last Sunday of our Summer in the Psalms. I know I've enjoyed it. I hope that if you've been here through any of the series that you've also just gleaned a lot and learned how to engage with the Psalms better. Um, so today we're going to be focusing on Psalm 8. And so just as we have been doing throughout the series, I would just invite you to stand with us. And we're actually going to read the Psalm in its entirety together. It just helps us to uh, get in the right space for it. So let's read this together. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Awesome. So, oh, we're not done. <laughs> I guess I was done. <laughs> you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. So let's just sing. Let's set our hearts and our minds on God this morning together as we sing. Praise. 
time has come still my soul will sing your praise just invite you to take a seat. We have a special testimony that is going to come this morning. So let's uh, welcome Bill Glasgow up onto the stage. Okay, shake out all the nerves. <laughs> wow. There you go. Perfect. All right. Um, like I said, shake out the nerves. A couple of weeks ago, I was sitting at home watching the service and the congregation had an opportunity to come up and tell how God was working in their lives. And I texted Rob right away. I said, oh, I wish I was there because I have such a story to tell you. And he said, well, let's work something out. So here I am. Um, so unfortunately, Andrew and I haven't been able to come a lot lately because of all sorts of reasons. Um, and before I share what God has done in my life, I feel it's really important to tell you um, how I learned to to give my fears and my wants and my needs to God and really give them to him. Um, and also how he has applied that in my life in the last two years. Um, so back in 2009, when I was a, just becoming a believer, um, I prayed for a, per a perfect job and the perfect wife because that's all I needed in my life. But a friend of mine reminded me, and he said, Bill, you can't keep on praying and praying and praying that. If you're going to give it to God, you have to give it to him. I said, okay, that's weird. So I thought about it, and I prayed about that, and I said, okay, God, here's my prayer. I want a job, and I want this, 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 and this, all in that job. And I want, in my wife, I want this, 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 and that. And I gave it to him, and I said, amen. And then between that amen and the answer to my prayers, I filled my life with faith, with trust in God. And within three months, I had a job at the Salvation Army. And six months later, I met Andrea. And when I met Andrea, the funny story is, is that she wasn't my type, she didn't like her. She was, just, she was just the lady who had a son who played with my kid in the, in the complex. And one day she was over for supper and we're talking away and I, Wow, this is exactly what I asked for, God. Thank you very much. It, it just st struck me. So, um, yeah, as I said, the answer to prayer is sometimes having that faith, that trust in God that you have to have. 
Okay, and now the story of what God's been doing in my life the last couple of years and how I applied that lesson of giving it to God um, to, to get what you want, to get that challenge. Um, so almost a year ago, on September 19th, Andrew and I stood up here with our grandson Theo and dedicated him to God. And we told you the story of how we had come to live, how he had come to live with us permanently and had already faithfully supported us. Um, we, we originally had said, no, we, we can't take him. But God kept putting it on our, on our minds, putting it on our, on our hearts. So we said, we will accept that. That, that what you want, God, and um, we took him in. Um, but what we didn't tell you at that time was three weeks earlier in August, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer, stage four lung cancer. Um, it's tough. <laughs> um, and it had spread to my brain and my abdomen. So uh, the diagnosis or the prognosis wasn't good. So chapter one of how God worked in my life, we call it the unexpected diagnosis because I've, I've never been sick before. I've, I haven't missed a day of work ever. Um, but I had this cough. It was nagging cough on and on and on and off. And I dismissed it saying I'm never sick. After several months, I finally went and saw the doctor and the problem I have is I always self-diagnose. Oh, it's, it's a, a throat infection, it's, a, it's, it's a sinus infection, it's something. It's nothing big. And finally my doctor insisted I go get a chest x-ray. So I went and got the chest x-ray and on July 28th I went to see the doctor and he said you have a 9 centimeter by 4 centimeter mass in your right lung. So I went golfing because that couldn't happen to me. There's no way that this is not happening. So I had one day of what I called despair, the woe is me, and that was July 29th, where I prayed to God. I said, well, why me? Why, 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 why? And God answered me, and he said, trust me. So I threw myself into morning devotions. I drew closer to God, and I knew the only way to beat this cancer was with the help of God. I found some great scriptures while I was doing my devotionals, and the first one I found was 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. It says, For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. And then in August, I went for biopsy and found out biopsies and uh, MRIs and CT scans and found out that the cancer had spread, and there was seven tumors in total in my body. Uh, the one piece of scripture I meditated on, and I found, I don't know how I found it, but I just, I found it, and I meditated on it daily, and I still do today. And it, it not only formalized my faith, but it, it blew up my faith. It just, and it's Jeremiah uh, chapter 17, verse 14, it says, O oh Lord, if you heal me, I will truly be healed. If you save me, I will truly be saved. My praises are for you alone. And I thought about that. You know, you read that, it's just, you know, if you heal me, you heal me. But it's a little bit more than that. Because if, you, if, you, if God heals you, you're, you're completely healed. It's not just put, putting a Band-Aid on a, on a cut. It's really healed. And I, I really love that verse. And I go, again, I dove into the devotionals. I have read everything on cancer and healing and faith. And I prayed all the time. And it's strange, I say, you say all the time, all the time, every, about everything. Hope the car will start. Hopefully I can, I can make, eat supper tonight. Everything I prayed about. Um, and then I finally gave my fears to God. And these were, it took me a while to get there because admitting your fears is tough sometimes. I had a fear of not being around to teach this baby uh, about God. I had a fear that my teenage boys would blame God and turn their backs on him. And the worst one was that I feared that Andrea would be uh, alone raising two teenage boys and a baby and it would overwhelm her. 
So then the initial treatment starts in September, October, November. Um, and I'd love to say that I handled this season well, but I, I did not. I did not do well at all. The enemy was battling hard to draw me away from God by putting setbacks after setbacks into my life and my treatment plans and even my family. Um, but with the help of God, through my devotions and prayers, I came to the knowledge that setbacks are just the enemy's attempts to draw us away from God's plan. So I dove even further into, into my devotions. Um, the treatment was, they started with the whole brain radiation to try and stop the tumors from growing. Then their plan was for chemo and immunotherapy from October on, but that didn't work too well. Um, I did some really cool research. I was looking into re in what immunotherapy was, and I thought it was gonna work. I thought for sure it's gonna work, but I had some pretty major side effects. Um, the probably October, November, I slept every day, four, 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 about four naps a day from two to three hours long. I was awake for maybe three hours of the day, and Andrea had to do everything for that, in that time. Um, I had extreme fogginess or dizziness. I actually even, I had two falls and I passed out on the day of my second treatment in the pa parking lot of the cancer center. So uh, that was a nice one. And then I had no appetite at all, none. Um, everything I put in my mouth tasted like metal. Um, a spoonful of corn made me want to throw up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the most I, most I ate every day was a bowl of cereal and a couple of insurers. So that's why I'm looking so thin up here. Um, I spent a total of 10 days in the, uh, in the hospital as so they tried to figure out why I was having these fevers. Um, but I didn't give up. I kept on praying. I kept on praying. And then I read James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For you know when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, if that's not the most amazing promise, I don't know what is. Because God's saying to you, have faith grow in your faith, grow in your endurance, and you will be perfect and complete. Uh, to me, that, I read that over and over again every day. Uh, finally, in mid-October, my, my oncologist decided to go to a chemo-only treatment. Um, I still wasn't eating much, but I continued to draw closer to God. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, I kept journals and devotions, I kept on writing out my devotions over and over again so I could just be immersed in God. Um, and then God led me to Psalms uh, 4.1. This, this is one of those scriptures that I kind of go, wow, that's, that's bold. It says, answer me when I call you, O God, who declares me innocent. Free me from my troubles. Have mercy on me and hear my prayers. And I want you to recognize that it doesn't say, oh Lord, please, oh Lord, I really want you to do this. It says, answer me when I call you. And I thought, that's pretty bold but it tells me that God is approachable. You can talk to God. You can be mad at God, and it's okay. He, he allows that. So in mid-December, my energy started coming back. I actually started to do two or four hours of work a day. I delivered Christmas cards. Uh, I even went grocery shopping a couple of times with my wife. Um, and I would testify to anybody who would listen to me and tell them what God did for my life. And then the final chapter is, kind of call it the comeback. Um, one of the devotions I read a lot and I read over every day says, Lord, surviving this cancer is not dependent on how tough I am, the expertise of my doctors, or the power of the drugs they give me. This, bottle, this, bottle, this battle is fought not by force or strength alone, but by your spirit alone. So it reminded me that God has a plan for my life. And one of the things I prayed for, which you might think is silly, but 
Um, I prayed for my appetite to come back in December. I said, I just want to eat. I just want to eat. I'm wasting away. I went from 245 pounds down to 189 pounds. And um, I asked him to give me my appetite back. And on Christmas Eve, my in-laws came over for supper, and they brought the turkey and gravy and all that. And I thought, oh, I have to be able to eat this. Two plates. Two plates, and I, and ever since then, I've been just eating like a horse. Um, and since, since then, my energy levels are increasing, my appetite's through the roof. I'm putting in now about four to six hours a day in work. Um, I go up, visit my donors. I, um, I played golf on Friday. I play golf every week, and I'm back to a regular gym routine. Um, and recently, I stayed home for a week with Theo all by myself while Andrea and Aiden went to Disneyland. So I thought if I had to push myself, I might as well really go far. Um, and then God brought me to a couple of verses in the Psalms uh, that said, Bill, you need to go and tell the world about this. And the first one is Psalm 118, verses 13 to 17, that says, My enemies did their best to kill me but the Lord rescued me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. I thought, wow, I will not die. <laughs> you can try, but I'm not gonna die. Sorry, Satan. And then the other one is uh, Psalm 9, verses one to two. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell you of all the marvelous things you have done. I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Now, the last thing I want when I'm standing up here is for anybody to have sympathy or pity or even praise me. Um, I told Rob, Pastor Rob very early in this journey that I feel more blessed now than I have in my entire life, and that's because of being able to draw closer to God, get to know Him, the support of my family and this amazing church family. Um, and, you know, there's people out there that say my positive attitude has been the reason why. Eh, probably it could be, but you know what? I know God's role in this whole thing, and I know, I know that it's all him and not me. And finally, no, I'm not 100% healed. However, my la latest scans in July showed the tumor in my right lung had decreased from uh, 9 by 4 centimeters to 2 by 1 centimeters. The three tumors in my brain have resolved, this is the word they use. They can't find them anymore. And I believe that the reasons why God is answering my prayers is that I accepted early on that healing may happen on the other side. And that doesn't always happen here. And I was ready for that. I was fine. And that when I gave my fears to God, I trusted him to hear my prayers and answer them. And he has answered them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill, for sharing your story. Why don't we stand together? Our hope and prayer in sharing testimonies um, in a church service like this is just that we would be encouraged, we'd be inspired, and um, just recognize that the God that is involved in one person's life is the God that we all are s serving, and he's so powerful and so good. So um, I love how Bill talked about a lot about um, giving his fears to God, and so we want to sing about that today. It actually wasn't planned that I was going to sing this song, but um, God knew, so let's sing this together. to fear. 
Jesus, we thank you so much for the way that you move in power, the way that you care so much about us, you care so deeply, God. We thank you so much for the encouragement that we received through Bill's story today, God. We just bring you all of our fears, we bring you all of our cares and concerns today, God. We just choose to lay them at your feet, trusting that you are good trusting that you can turn all things for good, for your glory, God. We just choose to sit in that today. We choose to grab hold of that and to uh, run after faith and to immerse ourselves in all that you are. So God, would you just uh, come and do what you'd like to do in us as we continue on this morning. We just love you. We praise you for who you are. All God's people said, amen. Why don't you have a seat? I'm going to call on Ryan to come.
Well, good morning, everyone. Well, this morning we are continuing in our series uh, on the Psalms, and we've been sharing, each of the speakers been sharing why a certain Psalm means a lot to them, and we've had just some fantastic um, teaching times. Um, I've been away, I was away for a couple weeks, but just heard like how awesome uh, people connected with Craig and Nolan's, and then Phil was just awesome last week, and so I hope that you're as blessed as I've been uh, in this series. Uh, So this morning, um, we are going to be jumping into Psalm chapter 8. But before I do that, uh, I should tell you who I am. (laughs) Uh, If you don't know, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. I oversee both of our local uh, and global missions, and I also oversee uh, our groups, and we got an exciting vision for our groups and for our church as a whole that we're really excited about uh, sharing with you in September, so uh, look forward to that together. But this morning, I want to talk about just how awe-inspiring creation can be as we start this morning. Now, uh, if you look at the screen behind me, I don't know if you've ever been like out in the country somewhere, like not in the city, because it's hard to see stars in the city, but if you've ever been out in the country, the stars are incredible on a clear night. Now, I grew up in southern Alberta, and there's just like sky forever there, and so on a clear night, the stars are just amazing, and I remember like one night going out, and there was a meteor shower, and there's just like shooting stars just going everywhere you can imagine, and as I sat there, uh, yes, stereotypically in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> I just was like in awe of how big God was and how immense the universe was. And in, it's like in moments like that, I really connect with Psalm 8 because David is talking about like just with how immense the world is and how incredible creation is. Like sometimes you just, in light of all of that, you just feel like, so small, and you wonder, like, like, does my life matter? Does, does God think about me? With all the things he's got going on, does he think about me? Or, or another way that makes me awe-inspired is, is when, I, when I climb. So recently, this is a picture of me at the top of Mount Pope a few weeks ago. Uh, we, we climbed Mount Pope as a family, and the views up there were stunning. Like, everywhere you look, there's just, like, it's surrounded by lakes. It's like there's almost like a ring of lakes. It's crazy. And Fort St. James is down and below, and it's just like you can see forever. And and, and you just see this, most places other than Fort St. James, whenever you look, it's just like wilderness everywhere. And you're like in light of like this vast wilderness I'm surrounded by, like, wow, God, you're incredible. But man, like, you feel sometimes like so small in light of all that there is in the world. And that's what David uh, is really getting at here. He's asking the question, like, in light of all this, like, does God care about little me? In light of all the things he has to worry about, you know? You know, he provides the rain, and he, and he takes care of all these different things to, in creation, and like, with all that he's got on his mind, does he think about me? Does he care about me? Like, why would I matter to God? Why would I matter to God with all the things he must have on his mind and all the things he must have to keep straight? Why would I matter to him? And so today, I want to jump in to Psalm chapter 8 because David wrestles with this exact thing. Why would God care about us as human beings? So, uh, if you have your Bible with you, whether it's uh, on a device like this, like I have this morning, uh, or you have a hard copy in front of you, either's great. Uh, Open it up. We're going to start Psalm 8, uh, verse 1. And uh, David starts off by this. He says, Lord, our Lord. And, and, And the Hebrew word here is Yahweh. So it's like he's saying like, God, our God. And, and this is significant because 
when God, he's both my God, but he's also our God. He, he's a God to all of us as human beings. Uh, this morning, I got the privilege of being on a call with some friends of ours from Kenya. And they're like, please uh, pass our greetings on to the church there. And like, how incredible is that? Like, he's my God, he's our God sitting here in Prince George, but he's also the God of my friends in Kenya. Like, awesome. Like, that's incredible. So this is what David reminds us. He's, he's like, he's my God personally, but he's, he's our God in community. And it's such a blessing that we get to share life with other people in community who also serve and love this same God. He continues, he says, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, now this word majestic, that's translated majestic, it's like someone who, it, it's used to describe someone or something that's big and grand and like awe-inspiring. So what David's really saying here is God is awe-inspiring. And that's how I feel. Every time I get out in creation, that's how I feel. I'm like, the creativity of God. Like yesterday, uh, I was out on the Bowron River. Uh, Rolf took me out there, and it was incredible. And like these huge Chinook salmon that have swam all the way down from the coast by Vancouver, all the way up the Fraser, and then all the way down the Bowron to get there. And they're like huge fish. And you're like, how? Like, that's incredible. And, and God put that into motion. He's the one that put the instincts in those fish to even swim all the way up there through all kinds of obstacles and fish ladders and dams and you name it. God is so awe-inspiring. He's so powerful, so incredible. He continues, and he says, you have set your glory in the heavens. That's, that's the reference to the stars, and David's going to come back to this, like the stars and the universe and all that is that we can see, and even beyond what we can see, like God's glory is shown by all of his amazing, incredible, expansive creation. And then he says uh, something really, really interesting. He switches gears a little bit in, in verse 2, and he says, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Like, really what David's saying here is he's saying God's strength is shown in revealing himself to the weak. Like, how often does, does God speak through, work through those of us who are weak, those of us like, like children. He can, he can speak and work through children, the vulnerable, the poor. It doesn't matter. God often shows his strength by working incredible things through the life of those that we might think are weak. He, he often uses the weak to humble the poor. God's strength is shown in the fact that he cares for even those that we consider weak and helpless, like infants and children. Like, how incredible is that? David continues, he says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, he's like, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. He's like, yeah, just all you need is your fingers, just like, oh, stars here, stars here, moon there, yeah, that looks good. Like, how incredible is that? He just spoke it all into existence, and it was, it was there. He's, he's like in awe of it, just like me under that starry sky in the back of that pickup. He's like in awe of how immense and vast the stars are and how incredible God is in light of that. And then he says this, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care about them. David's asking this. He's saying, does God keep us in mind? Like, does he, does he think about me? Does he care about my life? Like, how incredible was, was hearing Bill's testimony and how, 
how God has cared about all kinds of details of, how, of his life and how he's listening to Bill's prayer. This is what David's saying. He's like, does God think about me? Am I on his mind? Now, if, if you're a parent... Let me ask you a question for a second. How often are your kids on your mind? Like all the time, right? Like maybe, maybe you've gone out on a date and, and you just start talking about your kids and you're like, oh, we're supposed to be like together on a, on a date and we're talking about our kids. Here we go. Right? Because your kids, they, they're, they're, they matter so much to you and so they're, they're constantly on your mind. And may, maybe if you're a parent and, and your kids are now adults and they've grown, I'm, I'm sure that you still think about your kids. They come to mind often. And we are God's children. And He's mindful of us. He thinks about us. We're always on His mind. And then He says that, he talks about like attending to us. Like not only are we on His mind, but like He actually wants to engage and be involved in our life. Does, does, he, does he actually want to do that? Does he actually get involved at that level? David's asking. Do humans have any significance to God? Well, David begins to start to address his own question. Verse 5, he begins to say this. He says, he's talking about human beings. He says, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Now, the word for, that's translated angels here is the word Elohim. And Elohim in the Old Testament can, can be used to refer to many things. It can mean angels or spiritual beings, uh, like the NIV translates it here. It can also mean like uh, small g gods, like because all the people around serve different gods. Um, so it can, it can refer to that. But it can also mean like the triune God himself. Uh, if you look at Genesis, for example, when he says, come, let us make mankind in our image, that's Elohim, in our image. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, come, let's make humans in our image. And so some, some scholars say, oh, this is talking about how uh, he made us a little lower than angels. But some are like, no, 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 no. You're selling it short. He's saying he made us a little lower than him. Which, in my opinion, when you, when you continue in the text, I think that seems to me like a more what, what he's getting at here. And, and when he's saying that he crowned us with glory, what, how does he do that? Well, I think what he's saying here is he crowned us with the glory by making us in his likeness. Come, let us make mankind in our image. That's our crowning glory, that we are made in the image of God. So, of course you matter. You're made in his very image. And he gave us all kinds of incredible attributes like he has and gave us responsibility for all kinds of things like we're going to see as we continue to go through this passage. One of uh, the crowning attributes that he gave us is he gave us the ability to create. Like, we're sitting in this space. God didn't create this space. But he gave us the ability to create it. To cre and he gave us the ability to create all kinds of other things. Art, poetry, music, societies, cities. Like, how incredible is that? He, he continues, verse 6, he says, You made them the rulers over the works of your hands. So everything he created, he made humans, he put us in charge of it. He says, you put everything under their feet, all the flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and all that swim, the paths of the seas. God trusted us with overseeing his creation. Human beings are supposed to take care of it. Now, take care of it. We haven't always done the best job of that, have we? 
But, but that's, that's how much he cares about us and, and trusts us. Like, like how, like it, whether you're a kid or you're older and you can think back on it, like how awesome was it the first time your parents trusted you with some kind of significant responsibility? Like, here you go, do this, I trust you. You go camping, here you go, I trust you to build the fire. Oh, that's a big deal. Right? The first time your parents entrust you with something that seems significant, that sometimes how it seems like, oh, wow, there's a, there's a certain level of trust there, you remember it. It's significant. God is saying, I'm entrusting you with everything I've created, all this amazing, beautiful creation. I've given it to you. It's a gift to you. Take care of it. Do we matter to him? It's incredible that he would do that. And oh, by the way, I've, I've given you the ability to create. Enjoy it. Take, take joy in creating. I gave it to you. Just, just like I have that ability, I gave it to you. Enjoy it. And, and so then David, he ends the psalm in a really, really incredible way. He, he ends it the way he started it. He comes back around. And he says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth? Because in light of all that God has created and all that he made, and yet how much he cares about our lives as individuals and, and, and the responsibility he's given us, the trust that he's given us, the fitting response to that is awe, praise, and the surrender of our lives. Like when you think about how incredible God is and, and how amazing and powerful he must have been to create all that he created, that's awe-inspiring. And when you think that in, 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 even with all that, he cares about the, even the smallest details of our lives, wow, why wouldn't I want to praise a God like that? And if, if he's powerful enough, intelligent enough to do all that and still care about me, I can probably trust my life to him, right? He's, that, that's the kind of God that I can trust. God that's so powerful and yet cares about my life. Little me, he cares about me. The fitting response to that is indeed awe, praise, and the surrender of our lives. So then the question here that I want to leave with you is this. What will your response be? Because the fitting response might be awe, and praise, and surrender. But the other th incredible thing about God is He created us all with a free will. We get to choose. He doesn't force us to be in awe of Him. He doesn't force us to praise Him. And He certainly doesn't force us to surrender our lives to Him. We get the choice. So I want to ask you today, and, 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 and it's a daily choice that we get to make every day, What's your response going to be? Are you going to be in awe of God? Are you going to choose to praise His name? And are you going to choose to say, yeah, I trust you. I trust you with my life. I give it to you. You are worthy of my trust. You are worthy of taking the lead in my life, showing me how you want me to live. I trust you with that. As a, as a way of, of uh, sharing a bit of a response to this, I've invited uh, Marg. And Marg has written a beautiful poem, speaking of God giving us the ability to create. She has written a beautiful poem and is going to share a little bit of her response, actually, to this uh, psalm 
uh, chapter 8. And the incredible thing is, this wasn't planned. I didn't ask Mark to, to write this poem or, or share this response. She's like, she was just sharing with me one morning in morning prayer, and she was like already written this poem on this psalm. Like, God is already at work. So, Mark, please share with us this morning. Thank you. Is this good now? Am I being heard? So it actually started Good Friday, this part, and I came here on Good Friday to participate in what is called the Stations of the Cross. And it's a series of interactive stations that represent the biblical, biblical account of the events that led to the death and resurrection of Jesus. At the Station of the Tomb, I read a poem written by Cheryl Laurie. It was a reflection of what the disciples may have felt when Jesus died. It said, in part, we put everything we had in you, our trust. You offered us a taste of welcome, a hint of grace, a touch of freedom. Now we're left wondering which is worse, that it ended like this or that you knew it would end like this and you took us with you anyway. At that moment, I felt a huge wave of disappointment wash over me. I felt wrecked. I made the motions of going through the next station and then ended up in here where communion was being served. I sat here crying, ugly crying. I wanted to leave. I didn't want to be seen. Finally, I joined Ryan at the communion table. He prayed with me for the disappointment to be lifted that very day. As I drove away, I remember thinking, well, that prayer didn't work. So now, on this leg of my journey with God, we are taking along my disappointment. And as Phil taught last week, we can process all our emotions with God, and God wants us to. And Bill did such a good job of sharing how he did that as well. And so, on this road trip, God and I wrote a poem, simply entitled Psalm 8 Reflections. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, <clears throat> human beings that you should care for them? Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who are we, God, that you are mindful of us? We are uniquely and wonderfully made, intimately formed in that sacred, secret space. We are created in your image, known and loved, and a whisper of your breath caresses our face. We are complex spiritual beings, eternity embedded in our soul. You want us with you forever, where your love and joy overflow. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who are we, God, that you are mindful of us? We long for significance, to know life's meaning, trying to earn it by what we do always striving for the good life, but it's an illusion if it's without you. We are driven by our need to succeed, rarely stopping to count the cost. The rearview mirror reflects the children, their faces, lonely and lost. O oh Lord, our Lord, <clears throat> excuse me, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who are we, God, that you are mindful of us? We are overwhelmed with worry and with fear, burdens not meant for our fragile frame, addiction, anger, apathy, and circumstances that seem not to change. We are madly rushing but never arriving, chasing for what might feel best, searching for answers in dead-end places, and our lives are increasingly a mess. 
O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who are we, God, that you are mindful of us? We are a people who have lost our way, O God. We have rejected you with our mind. With the brilliant mind you gave us, we've decided we've got this, we're fine. We have replaced your thoughts and your ways because we are building the kingdom of man. The created has rejected the creator and it reeks of the enemy's plan. God, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. Jesus, help us. Who are you, Jesus, that our mind should be full of you? Here's what he says. God is my Father. I am his beloved Son. The Holy Spirit is with us. We are three in one. We have not been created. We have always been. We are distinctly different, and we are three in one. I spoke the world into creation. Not one thing exists without me. The beauty you see all around me, that's how it all came to be. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who are you, Jesus? that our mind should be full of you. The original scene was in the garden, and oh, what a glorious place. Adam and Eve, so happy to be there, with innocence, a glow on their face. I knew my enemy would deceive them. He is the father of lies. His temptation pleased all their senses, and the seed of sin infected my prize. God, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. Jesus, help us. Who are you, Jesus, that our minds should be full of you? I am the rescue plan in action. I am restoring God's kingdom to earth. And anyone who wants to may enter of water and the spirit a new birth. As you choose to live in my kingdom, you'll leave your old ways behind. Your pride and your ego can't live here. You'll need humility and a renewed mind. I didn't just come to save you. I want to teach you how to live, how to bless those who curse you, to live without anger and to forgive. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So come all the way in, Margaret, and sit all the way down. Surrender all that you think you are, and in humility, bow down. Come closer to me, Margaret, and you'll see the things I see. My vision will transform you and your disappointment will flee. Margaret, I love you. I know what's best for you, and what's best for you doesn't necessarily always feel good. Trust me, follow me, wait and see. O oh Lord, my Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Jesus, I trust you. I believe, help my unbelief. You know, this all looks so good on paper, Jesus. It's like those early mornings with just you and me, my coffee, my dog Moses, and it seems so easy. Then, as I go through my day, my queendom kicks in. That's where what Margaret wants done gets done. And Jesus, we both know that doesn't end well. And you know, Jesus, that I'm sincere when I tell you once again that I want to surrender my puny, self-centered queendom into your powerful, love-filled kingdom. <clears throat> but then, I am confident of this, though, Jesus, that you who began a good work in me 
will carry it to completion. I know that through the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit and with my sometimes wholehearted cooperation, I am moving in the direction of becoming more like you, Jesus. I know that because I'm not where I was and I'm not where I'm going to be. Thank you, Jesus. And Jesus, I love you too. As the worship team comes forward, let's pray. God, you know where each one of us is at, and you are always ready to meet us there, if we invite you. You love us and long to be with us. You challenge us to grow in our relationship with you. May we confidently, with trembling hearts, step into more of you as we trust you to show us what that looks like for each individual in this room and online. Amen. In a few minutes, we will sing, All to Jesus I Surrender. If those words get stuck in your throat, then please don't sing them. Maybe what you can't surrender is that terrible thing that was done to you, or that thing you did to someone else. Maybe it's the secret addiction you can't imagine living without. Maybe right now you can't trust Jesus because of the painful circumstances you find yourself in, or because you don't know who you're surrendering to. Tell Jesus as honestly as you can about that. Ask him to guide you to someone to talk with. And if you want to talk with a pastor and you don't know who they are, ask someone to show you or call the church office. And so, for the next few minutes, let's just sit quietly with Jesus, holding our thoughts and feelings before him as best we can. And if you sense in, in your spirit that Jesus is talking to you about something or any next steps or whatever, just tell him that you receive what he has for you. And then tell someone else, a safe person, someone that you trust.
just as we close with this song, I want to invite you to take whatever posture you feel you need to take, whether that's standing, sitting, or kneeling. And let's just end our time together in surrender. Sing this with me. All to Jesus I Thank you so much for being with us today. I hope that you are blessed and encouraged as you leave this place. A special thank you as well to Bill and to Mark for sharing what you have to share with us today. Amen. Be blessed. Have a great week.